about color, about the term, um, dang it, uh, you said Sierra can't get on? Um, hold on, let me see. Two people have entered the waiting room. Are they, okay. Can she get it, is she in now? Is, she, is Sierra there now, you guys? Uh, yes, uh, okay. a picture okay. of her. Okay, all right. Am I in? I yes. hear, yes, 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 okay. yes. Um, so the question that I wanted to pose um, for, um, for our group to discuss was about the term black, brown, and red. And the reason why I wanted us to discuss that is because what I've noticed on the news lately, especially like when they're now talking about COVID, um, when they're having these discussions about COVID, they'll say black and brown. Um, and sometimes, which is a rarity, and I'll be honest, I've only heard it once, maybe twice, but I can only recall one time where they said black, brown, and then they said indigenous. And then they alluded to um, the Nav what was happening on the Navajo reservation. And so I think even for me, um, as just, you know, another person of color, I've been even conflicted of, of you know, of when we, when the term, you know, black and brown, we know that when black is you, you're talking about African-Americans, we know that when they say brown, they're talking about Latino. And now on a societal level, when people hear brown, they do not use indigenous. You know, I mean, excuse me, they don't think of indigenous, they think of Latinos and maybe other people of color, but they're not in any shape or form thinking about indigenous. And so I was wondering, what do you all think about that? And what term do you prefer to be identified as? And, um, and how do you go back reclaiming something, which of course we know is a colonial term in the first place, which is an accurate. And so that's kind of what I wanted to start our conversation off with. And I will now kind of step back from it and hear y'all's thoughts on that. Whoever wants to start, because y'all know you can't see my face and I'm laughing right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I personally think, uh, I don't, I haven't heard the term red used in, or I don't think I've ever heard it used um, during my lifetime. Um, so, and I, I disagree. I think I generally, when I use like black and brown to refer, so I, I usually refer to indigenous people as well when I use black and brown. So, um, I think um, the the use of, especially with the COVID-19 thing, I think that um, Native people have done an excellent job of bringing attention to health disparities. Um, and so it's been putting pressure on um, politicians, especially because it's an election year, I'm gonna throw that in there, to make sure that they're covering all their bases and mentioning all the people, and mentioning all the things that um, the general population in America is really focused on right now. Well, I too don't really think of red as far as indigenous American people. I think they are not white, obviously, and so, and they're not black, so they will fall into the brown category. So personally, I, I see indigenous people under the brown category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that those labels, you know, they kind of all started out as a negative connotation. And over the years, they started to be used as, you know, kind of a necessary way to identify a group of people. So, you know, I mean, um, you know, I know some of you are a little younger than I am, but you know, there's the old red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Of course that, you know, that song didn't include brown. But, you know, originally, we, I mean, we know there are no white people per se, there are no red people per se, but those, I think, over the years have been used as a way to identify a group of people. So just like you've all been saying, you know, a lot of people are brown, you know, but when you say brown in general, people kind of tend to think that you're talking about one, you know, like Latino and such. Um, but, you know, Charlie Lowry, of course, she 
has a song that she wrote called Brown Skin. And it's really, it's really just that. It's kind of a generic use of, of the word brown. But uh, I think the misuse and abuse of those labels, and they all started out as labels, negative connotations. You know, you've got the Washington football team who use negative connotation and all of that. But I think at this point, you know, there's so much uh, disconnect between people. People are, tr are using that and trying to make it specific to somebody. So when you want to talk about a specific group of people, what do you say? You either say African-American or you say black or you say something else. And I think a lot of it now, although still, you know, a label and stereotypical and all of that, uh, it, it's being used because you, you not necessarily don't necessarily know what to call a group of people, you know, what's going to offend somebody, what's going to be appropriate, what do they actually claim. So I think it's really a a difficult construct um, mm. as far as where we are now. Um, I don't, you know, I don't particularly, I don't even know that I lean one way or the other per se. I think it's all in the way you use it. You know, it's okay to be called black in my opinion, I'm not black, but you know, I don't think of that in negative way. And so um, depending on who you, you are and where you've been and your history and ancestors and all that you might think differently but I just think it's all in the way the term is used you know when you think of that red skin you know I didn't grow up thinking that was a negative thing I thought yeah yay red skins we got somebody that is looking at us um, but of course over the years I learned how that term originated and what it meant so I've kind of changed how I thought about that so I think it's a lot a lot of it is based on where you are in your walk where you are in understanding how those nuances have developed over time and you know it's sometimes there just seems to be no other way than to use those color labels to specifically define who you're talking about Hmm. I didn't want to jump in. Uh, anybody else wanted to jump in? I'll say something on that, I guess. Yeah. Um, I guess because I personally fall in a, a lot of different categories when being described. So for me, I kind of agree with Sandra and or Sandra, apologies if I say that incorrectly, but um, in the way of, I try not to, to fault people for using those descriptive words because language is one of those things, like at the end of the day, we find words to describe people because that's all we have to differentiate things is words, is language, but, it is the intention you put behind words and it's the knowledge and it's the education and the, or the ignorance that you put behind the word that really bothers me. And it, um, when you're being descriptive and it, it bothers me in a sense, because there are so many people who have kind of falling back on what Amina was saying earlier, that cognitive dissonance of who people people are trying to figure out who they are and we're trying to figure out a time right now where we're being separated and we're also trying to find our own identities so like hearing that in the media can be really difficult but I think that if we just change the intention around describing people and describe everyone not leaving people out like you were saying you've only heard um white or black a couple of times I've never heard red either um personally but I just think that it's the intention and the knowledge that you put behind things. That's my opinion, but I don't personally like describing people by color. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my, my opinion. I, I don't like going, you know, full force in meeting people that way, but obviously in the news, you can't directly um, engage on a base to base, a name basis, or like that face to face conversation. So it becomes kind of difficult with the media masses. Yeah, I'll just, I'll add to that and say, I really think it depends on, like you guys were saying, context. Like, obviously, 
if a politician or elected official says something about red people, it's obviously politically incorrect. But um, as Sandra was mentioning with, you know, the black, white, red, and yellow, those are the colors of the medicine wheel, and those are the colors that are used to designate the four different people in the world. So um, context definitely matters. Yeah. So yeah, so I want to jump in, and, and that right there, when you were saying how on the medicine wheel, um, the the colors on there represent are if and if I'm not saying this correct, please correct me. On the medicine wheel, the the wheel represents the colors of the people too, and so if the colors on the wheel represent the people too, then what does that mean regarding establishment of of I don't want to say it, reclaiming an identity because I know that those 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 basic social constructs are not our identity. They were imposed upon us by colonial colonialism. But then, how does one kind of um, what is it come? I don't, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but come the terms regarding the black brown. Well, not all say black and brown. I'm going to say red and brown differentiation or issues surrounding it. Because you're right, like when I grew up, and I am older than you all um, on here, um, and so I hope I ain't thin nobody, but yes, older. <laughs> I love my joke. Okay, y'all not laughing. But anyway, so I know that um, when I was growing up, Indigenous people were always referred to as red you know, always. And so it's only, I think for me, I'm going to say maybe, I'm going to say probably five years. It hasn't been that long, but I'm going to say maybe the last five years have, no, I'm not, it's not, yeah, about maybe three or four years. Have I started hearing indigenous people refer to themselves as a brown people? Well, um, I, I'll go ahead and interject. Um, uh -huh. Indigenous is such a broad term, and it really um, is it, 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 it identifies all colors of people. Like there's no one because when you're indigenous, it just means like you have a tie to the land you're living on. So there's black people who are indigenous. There's indigenous people that are from the land of Africa. They are indigenous to Africa. We're indigenous to North America. Um, there's people who are indigenous to South America. People who are indigenous to Asia. So India, you know, there's there's all kinds of different colors of indigenous people. So I think it's difficult to try to fit it into like one construct of people because there's white indigenous people too. Um, the Sami people, um, they have whiter, some of them have whiter skin. Um, so it really just depends on, um, again, context. And um, yeah, like I said, it's just really hard to like fit it and you know, the color categories, because you can be indigenous, it, it just, mm -hmm. anyone can be indigenous if they're from um, the land, so mm -hmm. whatever land that they're living on, or have ancestral ties to, I should say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do, so how, so then what do you all think needs to happen regarding these titles like that because i'll be honest with you like i've been bothered listening to the news and knowing that the reason that a part of the erasure of indigenous populations and voice and issues and things has it is because of the fact that the term brown is used you know and because of what it's associated with so how does one reconcile that or or figure out what to do about that well you know the one of the one of the complexities of this whole thing is the default uh, non non marginalized group of people don't have to say anything they don't have to say you know, this is for the white people. They don't, don't have to say this is for the, the, the majority of the people who, who, who have most of what we have in this country. They don't have to say any of that. And the only way you can focus on a specific group of people is to use one of those labels. And, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, Native American, quote unquote, people who only want to be called Native American. And then there are others who only want to be called American Indian. And there are others who want to only be called indigenous. And, you know, because of colonization and because of the way America has evolved, there is no absolute way to refer to 
the whole group of nations who were here. So, you know, if you talk about being Diné or Navajo, if you talk about being, you know, one of the quote unquote five civilized tribes as the federal government has termed them, then people know who you're talking about, but there is no one category to associate all of the original indigenous nations of North America. So that's where I think the difficulty comes in because we all wanna be included. We all wanna have our space. And it's really difficult for the multiple indigenous nations of North America to have a common space because historically we've just been separated you know we've been told to to not claim each other we've been told that if you're not you know 100 percent that you're not native we've been told all these different things that caused a lot of divisiveness and so i think you know of course one of the complexities in all of that is that we are all kind of to a certain extent we're floundering around trying to figure out you know how do we really connect and unite and come together to be a more powerful group of people who aren't just marginalized. And you know, when I say marginalized, I that's a whole other thing to me. I don't even, indigenous people of North America to me are not even in the margins. We're not even on the page. And the only way we're going to do that, claim and own our space is if we come together and we stop this divisiveness, we stop this, you know, dropping people from the rolls, if we stop these things that were historically intended to separate us and, and take away our power. So, I'm uh, sorry, I guess I started ranting. <laughs> That's what this space is for. <laughs> I take a breath. <laughs> I would like to say something, uh, just to piggyback on what you said, Sandra, is that we all as a people just need to recognize ourselves. We need to stop waiting for uh, a, uh, a corrupt government to tell us who we are. If we recognize the next tribal community and vice versa, then I feel like there's more power in that than to wait around for some government to tell us who we are. I that's see. just, that's where I'm coming from. You have people indigenous, like you said, Amina, all over the world, where well, you have indigenous Americans that are on the south of the border. That's the sleeping giant right now. And mm -hmm. as far as this black and brown and red thing, in my opinion, our sisters and brothers south of the border, they are us as well. And I think once they realize who they are, then we can come together as a unit. And if someone needs something in a particular tribal community, they're not waiting for a uh, United Snakes of America, someone said this, and I remember this, to give them crumbs. They will look to us because we're one unit and we will take care of our own. As long as, like you said, Sandra, as long as we are still in this whole, um, this is this is mine, this, this is ours, you're not one of us, we don't want you, you're not, you know, 100% whatever as far as tribal connection, then you know, the people are just going to be uh, left on their own and they're just waiting for that government to help them versus all of us coming together. And if there's a tribal community that needs clean water, that needs face mask or whatever like that, as a unit, we can help them, period. So if we're united together as tribal communities and help each other, the hell with the so-called government that we're under right now. That's my opinion. Hmm. That's also true sovereignty, by the way. I'm just going to add that in there. <laughs> hmm. So, okay, let's talk about sovereignty. <laughs> what does that look like? Um, and, and I ask that because I've been even wondering what does that look like for us as African Americans? Because as African Americans, we are a people that don't have land. We don't have land. We have a home, but we don't have land. And honestly, to a degree, we don't have a home either. This is our home, but this is not our, um, this is not our ancestral home. You know, our ancestral home is, of course, across the Atlantic Ocean. 
And so we are a people too, that we struggle in a very different way regarding our connections. You know, our connections to, oh my gosh. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna let y'all, it's, it's Ruby. Oh, wait a minute. She's calling in. Hello? Hello? Are you hooked in the meeting or did you guys not go back on? We're in. So do you see that I says I'm waiting to join the meeting? Uh-oh, Ruby is giving me the business, y'all. I see what you now. It it's connecting. Yeah, it's connecting. Yes. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, bye. Here she comes, y'all. She was giving me the business. <laughs> yeah, we heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, sis. <laughs> um, so listen, let me, let me, um, I guess, let me kick off the sovereignty thing. Um, sovereignty is just like the labels that we've already talked about, red and yellow, black and white and brown. Sovereignty is, it means something, it means something specific, but in terms of federally recognized tribes and such, it's a double-edged sword. So, you know, the whole honor the treaties, honor the treaties, honor the three, honor the treaties thing, they've never honored the treaties. And so that definition that those treaties gave tribes sovereignty was just, you know, um, somewhat in, incomplete, incomplete, inaccurate, incorrect. It was a label that was given to make tribes think that the, the, the government was really allowing them to be sovereign, but they are not completely allowed to be sovereign. And um, I've heard people in the past, you know, uh, th there's a stigma, so to speak, on the having federal recognition. You know, some people think if you're not in a federally recognized tribe, and if you're not on the rolls of that federally recognized tribe, that you are not a native, you know? So, so there's that mind mindset, but there's also, um, there's a, a Hawassa Pony attorney that I interviewed some years back, uh, Tim Evans, and he said to me, he said, if you want to be a sovereign, just be sovereign. Stop waiting for the federal government to tell you you're sovereign and allow you to say you're sovereign. Be sovereign, and and it, and it doesn't mean you know, a, a Boy Scout club can go off and say they're native and then be sovereign. It doesn't mean that in any way, but you know, for there's a lot of state recognized tribes who have a, a business arrangement with their states, but then not with the federal government. And there's so many things I think that are, there's a price you pay to go after that sovereignty that the federal government recognizes, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs recognizes. Now, you know that the last year, uh, um, there were Virginia tribes who got their federal acknowledgement through, you know, 45. He signed a paper giving them that federal acknowledgement, and that process did not have to get approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But what they had to sign away to do that was to not be allowed to open a casino. Now, the Pamunkey tribe in Virginia, of course, they got their federal recognition I don't know how many years back, but they've got theirs before and they've got it through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So they still have that ability to do that. But tribes that are state recognized will spend 15, 20 or more years spending money, um, using resources, using time, using any funding they can, can raise or get, using that to go after that federal recognition. And a um, couple of years ago, I believe, um, the uh oh goodness it's, it's escaping me the tribe there's a tribe in uh upstate new york that got their federal recognition and lance gums goes around and talks about that process and you there is a, a big price to pay and once you get that federal acknowledgement there's red tape there's loopholes there's nuances and i think my opinion you still have to invest a lot of money you have to have a lot of attorneys you have to have a lot of fire to go after the things that the quote unquote treaties were supposed to allow you to have. You still have to fight for them after you get your federal acknowledgement. And um, I think it, it just, you know, as long as you are pursuing that for the right reasons, and I of course don't know all the reasons, 
reasons that that it is supposed to create a business to business relationship between that nation and the United States government. But even so, you continue to spend money, you continue to spend, find resources, you have to have a lot of legal support to still fight for those things that you think you're going to get when you get that sovereignty or that recognition. So um, another one of those complex scenarios, and I know that most people who are not living this and, and experiencing it and have communities that are going through it, they don't understand the complexities. You know, there's the, I know you've all heard people who say, oh, you're native? Oh, you don't pay taxes and you got a casino. Well, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of ignorance out there about the, the native people of North America. And you just have to be prepared to address all of those things and consider all of those things. So I think in some respects, if you are a sovereign nation and you know, perhaps you are recognized by your state, be sovereign. You know, let's see if somebody, if the Bureau of Indian Affairs comes after you for being sovereign. You're entitled to that. You should have that. And you should not have to wait for somebody to take your money and your resources for 20 years before you can get it. So, Ashe, I would like to say something. Um, I think also uh, being sovereign is having the right to bear arms, meaning if you and your community are protecting themselves, you know, with some kind of weaponry or whatever like that, I don't think that should be an issue. But I think the feds, they are afraid of people who may possibly be like a community that may, you know, be training terrorists or whatever like that. If I'm not mistaken, I think that part of the sovereignty is that you can't create your own army or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And I feel like yeah, in you're order right. to be sovereign, you should be able to protect yourself just in case, you know, That's you should be able right. to train your community how to take care of themselves and not to wait around for a government to maybe come in and look after them and their well-being so I yeah, think that yeah. should be part of it yeah you're, you're absolutely right I mean if you're truly sovereign you can form your own military do you think anybody's gonna let you know the Diné form their own military hell no you know um th there's just that it's the misled version of sovereignty you know um let's 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 say they've got sovereignty let them think that they're getting something but oh yeah we still got them under control they are still as mark charles often refers to we are considered domestic dependents who need to be taken care of so we don't have sovereignty you know and and every bit, little bit of authority federally recognized or even state recognized tribes, every little bit of authority they get, they still have to fight for it. So I, I think a lot of it is just distraction. Can someone touch on the United Nations and their, um, I guess their connection with indigenous Americans and sovereignty? Because I think if I'm not mistaken, one of the tribes out West was trying to connect with the United Nations for I don't know, some kind of assistance. And I don't know if that went through. If someone has some expertise on that, that would be great to share. I do not. Um, I That I don't know. And now we, I, I'm going to look it up, though, after we finish, because I, I do think that we should. Re, I, I know we'll revisit this again. Um, I don't know. And the reality of it is the United Nations Here's the thing about the United Nations. The United Nations has power, but the United Nations power is very limited to the United States of America. And the reason why it's limited to the United States of America, because we are the United Nations, if that makes sense, like we're on the council. And so in order for any initiative that goes out, out of the United, I mean, out of the UN, it has, if one person says no, then nobody can supersede that. And, and I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, um, but I know enough to know that any, 
anything that any initiative that may be put out regarding Aboriginal people, Aboriginal rights, um, sovereignty, anything that of that that's put out, it, if it is to include the indigenous of the United States of America, which we know it does, it doesn't matter if the United States of America does not adhere to it. Does that, you know what I mean? Um, because if our council says no, or, or they don't want to follow through, then there's nothing that the United Nations can do. And make no mistake, I've always wondered about sovereignty and the, and the role that the United Nations played. Um, I know that when Standing Rock occurred, if I am correct, the United Nations came out. Mm. And I think they did a report. And so I would ask somebody to please fact check me. Um, and even though they did this report, you know, nothing happened. Like even for African Americans, the United Nations has been here in this country. They didn't come last year, if I'm correct. But I know prior to when President Obama was in office, um, they came here to this country, what, about three times, I want to say. Um, and because the, the, the last report that I know that Flint, Michigan had asked them to come. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm correct, but they also had come to, 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 they did a report on policing, you know, of the police brutality that's taken place here in the United States of America. And one of the things when you read it, they talk about how the United States should be giving reparations to African Americans. Mm. You know, it's like one of their suggestions and everything. And of course, look at where we are here now. <laughs> if we had been look, if the if the United States was falling through like it's supposed to, we would be doing this with with me being in Africa somewhere. <laughs> look at it on a chateau or something. You know what I mean? And so, um, it's it's really the United Nations. Sometimes, and I don't know if I should say this or not, but I won't lie. Sometimes just me being a history teacher, sometimes to me, they just seem like the League of Nations. And I don't know if you guys really know the history of the League of Nations, but the League of Nations was kind of the um, precursor to the United Nations, you know, and the reason why they weren't able to sustain themselves is because they were weak. You know, they were a weak entity and the United Nations, it's not strong like I think it should be or like it was created to be. And I think for us here in this nation as a, a melanated people who are under oppression, um, I don't know how the United Nations can benefit us. Because even if you think about, you know, we know that women like Biji and um, LaDonna, um, I can't remember LaDonna's name, last name, you guys. Allard, is it LaDonna Allard? Um, you know, they went to, it was, you know, them, they and other indigenous people, they went to the United Nations to ask for help about what was happening at Standing Rock, mm -hmm. you know? And what happened? I mean, it's good that they got national attention and I won't lie and not say that that national intention um, did not have some type of impact or effect. But one thing that I didn't know if it hadn't been for me, like following people like Chase Iron Eyes and stuff like that, is that like when Standing Rock is happening and everything, this nation's, like why everybody here in the United States of America did not know it was happening. This, this nation was putting out the, the message that what was happening out at Standing Rock basically that the water protectors were basically criminals and terrorists. Like the message out there was that they were terrorists. Hmm. And so we here in this nation as people of color, we're fighting against that type of machine to whereas the United Nations power is very limited and they may in, in this regard, honestly speaking, have no power regarding the United States because United because you because we are a part of the council and we're not just a part of the council we're like one of the top leaders like we're the ones that give uh, most of the money that helps to support the United Nations stand you know what I mean ability to stay to to just be an entity and um 
And so, and I know I kind of talked a little bit longer than I intended, but I do think maybe that's something that we all need to look at because always we're in, we're a nation right now that's in crisis. And realistically speaking, if our government turns on us as a people of color, we should be able to reach out to the United Nations. Honestly speaking, as indigenous people, you know, those who are, are tribal, who have sovereignty, if they are an attack people, if they truly have sovereignty, they really should be able to reach out to someone else outside of this nation and say, hey, we need help. Like they should be able to reach out if I'm correct and I understand sovereignty correctly because maybe there's something to indigenous sovereignty that I don't fully understand too. But shouldn't they be able to like, even with Standing Rock, shouldn't they have been able to pick up the damn phone? Or, you know what I mean? Or something and say, hey, United Nations, can you send a mediator? If nothing, if you can't send troops here, which I know we wouldn't ask for troops because, you know, we're peaceful people. Damn it. But anyway, but can I have a mediator to come out here, you know, and, and to have a conversation with my government? Because this is what's happening. And we've got another, you know, another Fort Laramie Treaty is being broken. You know, and so I do wonder about when, you know, if this country implodes on itself, what does that mean for people of color? And who are we going to have to turn to to ask for help? Because I don't think it's the United Nations, because if some if we ask United Nations and you, all the United States has to do is say no you can't come in here or no, I'm voting against this policy or this bill or this initiative that you've put out. And there's nothing the United Nations can do. I know um, in terms of Standing Rock and even more recently, Mauna Kea, there have been indigenous representatives to um, you know, speak out about um, the environmental destruction, the effect that pipelines are having on their communities. Um, I'm not, I'd have to do more research on how those conversations went. But um, generally speaking, um, I definitely think there is an indigenous presence and an indigenous voice or our voices get heard in those arenas. Um, but like you said, it's a matter of um, if um, the government as a whole is gonna jump in and halt anything, any action from actually occurring. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to do more research on that. But I know in the past, um, like you said, I was doing research on um, biopiracy and um, the protecting of intellectual property of indigenous people. And one of the biggest issues with biopiracy is um, the reduction of biodiversity. So um, starting in the 1990s, the UN was starting to meet about um, protecting, they had the con convention of biological diversity. And I think the majority of the countries ratified it except for four. And it was the United States who was one of those four. So in terms of um, being on board with more, um, I don't wanna use the term progressive, but I'm gonna use the term progressive and progressive initiatives like that. No, you're right. I, I, I think that, yeah. I, and I, I know what you're saying is right. Like I don't, and, I know that I have no doubt that indigenous voices are heard. And let me say this, I know that the plight of the African-American is heard around the nation too. The thing is though, is, is really like, you know, like you stated, Amina, is about the role of the government. Is the government gonna step in? And the reality that we live in is our government is not gonna step in because our government is the problem, you know? And the government is supported by society, you know, as a whole, unfortunately. And when it comes to the United Nations, I'm just, I mean, I know that they, their leeway in this nation, as far as I can tell, and if anybody wants to jump in, because I see Brianna out there not saying nothing, but, <laughs> but um, you know, honestly speaking, you know, I don't know what type of power that the United Nation actually has in this nation. And honestly, I don't think they have any power because let me say this, it's not that they don't have power. It's about at what cost are they willing to get involved in what's happening here in this nation? So you're saying that nobody wants to go to war with the United exactly. States. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, nobody wants to go to war. 
you know, because that's what's going to happen. And make no mistake, if this nation implodes on itself and itself, and let's just hypothetically say that there was a revolution, because, you know, we call it a revolution, you know, the others, they call it a civil war. <laughs> um, if something like that happens, nobody's stepping in. You know what I mean? Because they recognize that you're you're talking about this is a whole different type of beast like racism is a whole nother type of beast because now if i get involved in this i also have to look at what's happening in my own backyard and racism has become this global phenom but the united states we are a different entity than everybody else is because of how racism evolves here and the reality of it is is our ground zero is different from everybody else's. I always, every time I teach about the French Revolution, I cannot help but look at our nation because I see the similarities that are there. It's quite honestly scary. And I believe that we are a nation that has the ability to be able to set a type of precedent that will literally ring across the globe. And I am, a, and I tell you, we are going to have the, this nation is going to have the ability to be able to have, like the English did a long, 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 long time ago, a glorious revolution where it's bloodless. Or if we have one, it will be one of the blood, bloodiest that will go down in mankind's history because of how this nation was created and formed and how it changed the rest of the globe. You know, and so, yeah, I, I, I tell you, I don't think anybody is going to touch really anything serious, especially our race issue, our race problem, as the others tend to call it. They're not going to touch this with a 10 foot, 10 foot pole because they recognize that if we touch this, war will be declared. And if you guys know anything about the French Revolution, when the French Revolution ends, in the end, do they get their republic? Yes, but the blood that it cost. And the scary part, what a lot of people don't know is, is that when the French Revolution is taking place, the French are warring with people like four or five different nations at the same time. Like they're having this civil war and they're also having a war on the outside. And these people were literally able um, the common people were literally able to bring down their government, their nation, and reform it while they're fighting four or five different nations. And I'm going to tell you, the United States has the capacity and the ability to be able to do that because of our military power. All right, I'm done. I'm going to jump in. And um, the history, I, I think... Um, the war we'll be fighting is gonna be a little bit different than wars we fought in the past. I think it's gonna be more spiritual and mental than a all out physical war right now, um, in my opinion. Um, and I'll tell you why I say that. And going back to the sovereignty conversation, I think that um, as Erica was alluding to earlier, as soon as we start sustaining ourselves and stop relying on the Bureau of Indian Affairs, stop relying on Indian Health Service, and we create our own systems within ourselves with our own resources, we're a fully functioning entity. We don't need any government assistance. That's the first step is not needing that extra assistance. Um, and you know, that's, that's a big step. We get a lot of funding from those agencies, but also federally recognized tribes are the, most of the tribes that get funding from, from um, that pot. Um, there are some funds that are allocated to um, state recognized tribes from state government and um, I know um, Lumbee get housing assistance from HUD, but um, so every tribe looks different with how much assistance that they have with the government. But um, as soon as we start cutting back on what we need, um, I think that's the first step to becoming um, a full sovereign entity. I don't think we have to jump to um, creating our own military yet. Um, that's something that's way down the line, way down the line. Um, I don't see that being the first thing that we do. Um, but another reason why I say it's more spiritual is um, there's just this, this huge movement of people healing themselves. Um, there's people that are um, really healing these deep historical traumas um, these things that have been passed down through generations. Um, this generation is 
taking back our power. And we're seeing how much power we actually have. And I think, um, I think there's already a revolution happening on, on a non-physical um, field. So, um, and I think the more that we take time to really um, suture those wounds for ourselves, we suture the, the wounds of people around us too. Um, and before you know it, you have a community that um, feels, that feels validated um, that reclaims all that power that was taken away from us. Um, like, I mean, if you look, there's people that are out here, um, uh, writing the history the correct way or going back and rewriting white men's history for us to understand it from our perspective. There's people that are, um, restructuring the education system. There's people who are going into medicine, who are going into law, who are changing these systems. So, I mean, I think, the evolution to getting to full sovereignty is is a slower one and it may not be like the quicker more instant gratification from fighting an actual war but i think we're going to get there um just we have to just keep taking it one step at a time i want to say something about the spirituality um concept i just saw on netflix maybe a week ago uh, a movie called indian horse I don't know if you guys saw that. And it's it's I yeah, can't I can't exp I can't explain how deep the pain and anger that I experienced while watching that. And I come from a Christian background, okay? But at the same time, the individuals that experience that dark energy hiding behind the Bible struck a nerve with me because so many people have been abused in the name of, right? And like you said, I mean, a lot of people now are starting to tap into their spirituality. Um, some people are actually trying to go back to, I guess, their indigenous spiritual walk, how their ancestors prayed and things of that nature and getting back to that, getting back down to their roots. And I think that in and of itself will help people find their true path and where they need to be and how they should uh, uh, treat other people and things of that nature. But that movie, and of course there's so many different stories and so many different experiences, but that's just a snippet of how you have this power structure called, you know, whatever. In this case, it was the Catholic Church and how they would break the spirit of children, ripping them from their culture, their people, their, their spirituality, and they ripped them from that. And they beat in this so-called uh, entity that they claim loves them. And so I think a lot of people now are breaking away, not necessarily from the, the, the spirit of the Prince of Peace, but seeing it in a different way, because just because someone lives out in the middle of nowhere, that does not necessarily mean they don't know God. They never experienced God. And so I think a lot of people are now uh, going back spiritually where their indigenous roots are as well. Um, and I mean, frankly, that's where I am right now. Frankly, that's where I am right now. Um, and I think when people uh, recognize that, then they'll find themselves in, in the rest is history. But I think it's, it's, it's a full circle. It's coming back around again. Um, whatever their uh, spiritual path was, their ancestors are speaking to them and helping them get back on track. And so I, I understand what you're saying, Amina. I agree with you about that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to jump in now. I'm the crazy okay. one. <laughs> and this is all I'm going to say. All okay. I'm going to say. Okay. Is that, is that, no, first of all, you guys are right. I agree with you. I think that this, um, this, this, what we are in, what we are 
in what we are in experiencing in the what we are in the midst of and we're experiencing i think it's actually happening on on all different realms or all different levels i think these things are actually happening happening simultaneously you know what i mean like i think the spiritual walk as well as well as the physical walk and the higher realm walk is all taking place at the exact same time um whether it is being you finding yourself um ancestrally wise and going back to your blood or your bone memory um you know or it's even you know going you're expanding further out that to the to the cultural aspect of who you are as you are out here at the same time trying to defend yourself and your space because the reality of it is is that for us as um as a melanated group and as the original oppressed in this hemisphere you know, we're always, unfortunately, we've been put into a place where we, in some shape or form, we're always facing some type of battle. Um, and what I will say is, is, is um, I, I can't, I know both of you all spoke about um, religion. And I think I'm gonna kind of uh, jump off a, a little bit off of what you said. Um, dang it. Um, oh my gosh, Erica, Erica, you still there? I don't see you um i'm here okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> off of what you said erica about christianity and how christianity is used as a tool and you know you're absolutely right christianity is used as this tool in order to make us um we were already a humble people but now i think it is used as a tool in order to also make us uh, um to take away our will regarding how to defend ourselves mm -hmm. And the one thing that I have always said, and and, I, and I'm gonna stand by, is that spirit did not send us down here to be slaughtered. Spirit did not, creator did not send us down here for us to allow ourselves, to allow people to hurt us, to mistreat us, to manipulate us, um, to be used as tools and pawns. Spirit and creator, they have given us tools that we ourselves have got to decide how we're going to utilize them and, and what that looks like. And if it means that you've got to, you've got, we're supposed to defend ourselves in any, any way that we can. And until I think that we get to that point in recognizing about, we've got to value ourselves and our community and our collectivity the way that spirit does. And, and I think that when we start to look at ourselves through the eyes of how spirit, how creator has valued us, it's the reason why we were made. You know what I mean? We were made for purpose, all of us. And until we start to value ourselves and, and, and to see our power, then, then um, then there's always going to be, we're always going to come from this place as, oh, I don't know if I want to say this on, hmm. we're always going to come from this, this place of, of, what is it, tempering down who we are and our power. And I think that in some way, in some regards, we're going to have to figure out a way to become unapologetic with our presence and to recognize that if we have to defend our way, ourselves in certain ways, that's okay. Because everybody else around the globe gets to defend themselves. And you can be spiritual and still protect what is yours and your person by whatever means necessary, as long as you're not coming from a place of intentional evil, you know what I mean? And, and, and intentional of uh, trying to op oppress someone else. And so I would say for us to kind of consider that or to think about those things that, that we weren't we weren't sent here, we weren't sent here to be a slaughtered people to be an oppressed people. And that as we go through this journey, we're gonna to have to recognize that we're gonna to have to be working in all realms at all times in order for us to be able to um, become the powerful entities that we were put on this planet to be. Because if we don't make no mistake, there ain't gonna be no earth. You know, and I'm using colonial times because she is really our, she doesn't need us. You know, she's our matriarch. You know what I mean? But who else is going to protect her if we're coming from these, 
if we're coming from a place to where as we still are we still are afraid to grasp hold of who we are as a powerful people and i do understand why we're afraid of it you know and that is another conversation for another time mm -hmm. um and, and so, yeah, you know, I, and I get that, but at the same, you know, we've got to, we've got to figure out what that looks like as a people for us and, and start having those conversations, you know, too, because I'm going to tell you, we are in crisis right now, you know, and we are being attacked on all sides, whether it's through sovereignty, whether it's through blood quantum, um, whether it's on the news, it's through disease, like being the face of COVID, you know, we are being attacked at all sides. And how do we get to defend ourselves? Because I know there's so much we could get into this, with this, but we need to understand that spirituality is not supposed to be, a, we were taught that spirituality was supposed to weaken you. And, 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 and it was imposed, about it, imposed upon us so harshly that that's what it did. But spirituality is not supposed to weaken you. Spirituality is supposed to empower you and to remind you of who you are. X. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Just one more thing. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. She's like, what <laughs> for? Um, well, I was just thinking, um, I think the way that we've been subdued has evolved over a period of time. Like, you know, it started out with just initial genocide or attempted genocide rather, um, where they're just outright killing us. Like we were, our bodies were not valued. We were not valued at all. And then it turned into a period of assimilation where we were subdued and forced to um, cast away our native identity, our black identity. And um, now things are a little bit more insidious. And so that's why, um, in my mind, I think um, our response has to evolve too. Um, and I'm not saying like, if I need to throw hands, we'll throw hands. Um, <laughs> but, I <agree. laughs> but I think that um, infiltration is a very powerful tool in this day and age. Um, I think using the system that they created to subdue us against them um, is ultimately one of the one of the biggest things that we can do but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for people who are really putting their bodies on the line for these movements um, i think that's just as important so there's different um i think there's different um roles people are playing in advocacy and in the movement and the revolution um it's just a matter of you know finding our niche finding where we need to be to optimize the movement and having a safe place to come together and talk about it and plan and have action and um, I see a lot of people doing that now. So, Mina, we got to cut your part out after what you just said. You done told the secrets. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mina done told the secrets. She's like, this is what we going to do. <laughs> oh, my bad. I forgot we're on Facebook. <laughs> it's all good. You know what I've started to realize, you guys, is that honestly speaking, there's no time for hiding because I'm starting to realize now that um, technology is going to not allow us to hide, you know, and that, and I think you're right, Amina, is that now our actions do have to evolve, you know, and maybe those things is having these conversations out loud so that they can understand of how literally our people have had 400 to 500 years to truly, truly rise up. And as a people, because we are peaceful people, we've chosen not to we have chosen to continue again to be a peaceful people and try to extend our olive branches and to have conversations and to try to figure out a way to create some semblance of us working together and figuring out how to share this space together you, you know and so you know no i i think that we do you're right we have to figure we have to we have to evolve and if you know technology is going to piece be a piece of that evolution then what we do is we use it utilize it to the you know the best of our ability um and so on that note i know that we have five more minutes not unless you guys want to go longer but i was thinking give us five more minutes um and then we could close this up until next week and so is there anybody that wants to share anything any thoughts that maybe i don't know you didn't get to say anything while we were talking you want to um input on that or you want to share something else um 
Um, I just wanted to pop in because I know I missed the beginning part. So that's a lot of why I didn't say anything. I was just kind of following along to see where the conversation was going. So I kind of gauge what the question was that I missed because mm -hmm. uh, I had to take a nap. Ramadan is hard, y'all. <laughs> it's real hard. <laughs> um, but um, I think in having conversations like this versus my conversations with non-relinated folks. Um, it's interesting to see that the, I guess the dynamic of the importance of starting at the individual level, because they know, like even a lot of my more politically, socially, like racially aware um, white peers and like clients and stuff realize that the government that their ancestors have made is not going to help <laughs> uh, do what they now realize is right. And so they want, they're starting those initiatives at the individual level with hopes of it having the, I guess you could call it trickle up effect. Um, but I think seeing the solidarity, I guess, between um, like First Nations folks and, and African-Americans will be a whole new realization, I think, for other people, um, and not even just white people, like Latino people, um, people who identify as Hispanic that aren't actually necessarily Hispanic, like not from like descendants of Spain Hispanic, um, seeing that solidarity and recognizing that history and the, I guess the, the fortitude and the resilience of it and the possibilities that can come out of that um, will really shape how we're able not only to do, to be effective in our own communities, but to get others to help uplift, uplift us as well. Ashe. Ashe. Anyone else? That's good stuff, Rihanna. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was great. I'm glad you were able to come in. Um, I, my, my thought, my last thought, I guess, is that we have to be unapologetically whatever it is we are. And that means that some people are gonna be uncomfortable. Some people are gonna be uncomfortable. You know, people come to me and say, wow, if you didn't talk about native stuff all the time, I would never see any of it. I would never know any of it. I've never been exposed. I don't even think there are any natives we're in my city or in my state, you know, that I hear those things all the time. And, you know, I, I have to, I had to become comfortable with bringing that as making that my presence, you know, people are like, uh, wait a minute, is she native? What is she? She doesn't quite look native as well. You know, she don't look like Pocahontas. So I don't know what she is, but she keeps saying she's indigenous and she keeps saying that's her community. That's her family. That's her people. And I had to become un unapologetic about that because if I don't do it, in my immediate circle, you know, the people that I'm, that I work with, the people that I walk around and walk amongst, they don't know anything about it. And I have to represent in whatever way I can. I am so sick of turning on the TV every day and popular media and never seeing native people. You know, you see, you see all different ethnic groups, you see all different, you know, genders and, uh, sexual preferences and all of that. You see a lot of representation across those nuances, but how often do you turn on a TV and you really know that there's an original indigenous North American person descendant on that TV or on that radio? So we have to seek it out every way we can and we have to present it. We have to, that's my, that's what I present. That's what I say. Sometimes it's not comfortable for me, but I'm like, hey, every piece of land that you walk on and you exist on was originally belonged to a different group of people that you don't even know have descendants here anymore and you don't give any recognition to and you don't include in any of the narrative. So that's why we have to be absolutely unapologetically vocal and inclusive and representing that. And that's why we have to be united as people of color to make sure that that is not drowned out because there are people out there who want to drown it out. Oh yeah, just 
you know, just ignore them. They'll go away. They'll slink back into the hole. They, they won't be, they can't take over what we have stolen. And that's why we have to continue to do it. And, and like I've heard on, on this call, you know, in some cases that might require putting, putting some pause on somebody, but, you know, we have to be unapologetically loud about it because there are many, many, many people who want to take over that space, continue to hold that space that a lot of us have never had. And, you know, we, we are the foundation and we have to become, we have to rise up. We have to become united. We have to rise up and we have to take that shit back. Excuse me. Um, just to interject here really quickly, cause I hadn't said much, but and I looked up guys about the UN and the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous People was first adopted in 2007, but the United States did not endorse it until 2010. And that in itself, what we were speaking on is an issue and a problem because how did three years go by before the United States even wanted to address it? And this is 2007. And then 2016 was Standing Rock in August. Well, it had been going on, but the popularity was in August. And then, okay, President Obama at the time did put a halt to it in September. But there we go from 2007 all the way to 2016. That's totally, totally just not, it's just not right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And wasn't it, I think it was. Was it not, was it Susan Rice that was the one that was on the council at the time? Was, uh, cause it happened under, under, under President Obama's administration. I didn't get that deep in there. I was just trying uh, to get the initial dates just uh -huh. to show the timeline of, you know, the indigenous people bringing it to the mm -hmm. UN in 07, United yeah. States not wanting to hear it or accept it until 2010. And yeah. then Standing Rock was prior to 216, yeah. but that's like you said, when we saw it in the news, mm -hmm. you know, the main scope of people. Mm -hmm. That's horrific. I'm about to get mad, y'all. <laughs> I, Any... I have one other thing to, um, to mention. As far as people being vocal about who they are, I think some of us are not quite comfortable um, publicly speaking about our indigenous connection. So if we were in an era where uh, Black is beautiful, whatever like that, some of us are not comfortable enough to, you know, publicly claim their Indigenous American ancestry. So I think that in and of itself, we have to work on as well, people feeling comfortable embracing it publicly and others giving them a platform to do that. Because, you know, in, in some communities, people who, you know, have been told they are Black, and now they are rediscovering their Indigenous blood, DNA, genetics, they're almost like laughed at. So I think a lot of people need to be comfortable enough to publicly say and be what they are. And so I, I just wanted to add that as well. I think that in of itself will help people recognize what an indigenous American person looks like other than somebody out West or Pocahontas or whatever like that. Cause we another all look thing, different. I totally agree with you on that. And another thing we need to step up with, I'm, I'm not really into football, you know, my husband, I'm from Maryland and I know this has been beating the ground forever about with Redskins and the mascots and things like that. But until we as humans and as indigenous and African Americans and whatever you want to call yourself say that that should not be it should not be happening it's degrading because just like I've always brought up if they called them the jigaboos mm. the Washington jigaboos we'd be real pissed mm -hmm. the whole we'd stadium be would have been burned pissed. down mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. until we all get together on that th that to me is a simple thing Mm -hmm. But it really isn't when you look at it, because when we were talking about the type of war and the type of things that are going to make things happen and make people stand up and listen. Yes, I believe spiritually, but it's going to be on the class thing as well. That's why um, we do need to get into politics. Um, I didn't even know. I didn't even think about it. But when I saw Ms. Hope, 
um, at the paradigm, it just made me realize, yeah, they're, they're not indigenous Native Americans on the news and on the radio, except for her radio. You really don't hear that. And the only time someone wants to see it is when they stick a feather in their head. And that's totally ridiculous. It's just, it just shouldn't be. And until we all do something and say something every time we see it, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg right there in itself as well. You know, mm -hmm. even, you know, the Seminoles and things like that. It's just time out for that. It just needs to change. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my two bits. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Agree with all that. And, and, you know, what you said, Erica, you know, originally it was easier for some indigenous people to just blend into um, black communities and say they were black. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get killed one way or the other, but if you can mix in with a black community and be safe because that's a larger community, I'm going to, you know, protect my family. So some of that happened historically. And I know there are tribes that say they never did that, that they always stayed in their, you know, on their original land. They always stayed original people, mm -hmm. but you know, East Coast in particular, we are Blendians. We are all Blendians. Um, and I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I am happy. My heart flutters when I come across or, or hear from somebody who is truly more than 90% original people from, from here. But it's a rarity and we are blended. And a lot of that was not by, it was not, it was by force. You know, there was a lot of rape. There was mm -hmm. a lot of that kind of thing going on but there are people who are absolutely accepted by this culture as native and people don't even know that they're half they got a one ancestor was native and one ancestor was white you know but because of their appearance because they look like you know i hate to pick on zon they look like little tonto zon mm -hmm. is perceived as a native man and he is a native man but his mother was i believe dutch so you know it's that visual perception that people have so if they don't see somebody walking and talking with braids and feathers they don't think there's native people around them and we are all walking amongst indigenous people every single day but we just don't know it because they don't say it they don't talk about it they're not wearing regalia and feathers and they're not wearing turquoise jewelry and all of that. And we have to be open and accepting. I've had so many people reach out to me and say, my parents were native, but they left the community. And we were, we grew up in a black community. All I know is being black, but I want to reach, I want to connect with my indigenous ancestry, but nobody will accept me. Nobody allows me to do that. And and it breaks me. And we, of course, have 100%, for the most part, indigenous people whose parents were removed and sent to boarding school. Mm -hmm. They never were linked on paper to that nation, and that nation will not accept them. And there is so there's so many opportunities for us to separate and segregate from each other. And we've got to stop that nonsense. We have got to allow all of us Blindians whether you're blended amongst different ethnic groups or whether you're blended amongst different indigenous tribes, we're blended. And we have to start to accept and allow and bring each other back into the circle because all it takes for us to never be able to rise is to keep up with that divisiveness and continue that nonsense that you can't be counted and you can't be included. And, um, you know, so... Uh, so I agree with what you're saying, Erica. I know that. I know a lot of people. My parents, believe it or not, my parents' birth certificates originally said they were colored. Now, look at me. Do I, do I look like what is interpreted as colored? Do I look like I'm black? Do I look like I'm native? Do I look like I'm white? I don't think I look like any of those, but I know who my ancestors were, and I know what community I was raised in. And if somebody wants to tell me that I am non-Indigenous, I am going to kick their ass. <laughs> that's I wanted, that's uh, what I got. I wanted to um, to make a quick note of what Sam said and then Erica, right? Erica, um, yes. Um, something linked to that. I think what, when you had mentioned about, you know, some people not being as forthcoming or willing to be as you know open and out there and Sandra being the kind of the opposite and being like no nah, you gotta love know how it is you gotta say it with your chest mm -hmm. um 
And I think that's where, um, because I've been at both ends of that spectrum. When I was younger, I wasn't as uh, forthcoming as I am now. Uh, (laughs) But I know that in having different conversations with people of different ethnicities or even like my my variations of friends who are Indian, but they're different ethnicities and religions on all and being part of the Indian subcontinent. Um, being that third party to say it for somebody. Um, Cause I tell people all the time, like, if you don't want to say it, tell it to me, I'll say it. You want, I know you want to pop off in this meeting and you're not going to, you want me to do it? I'll do it. Um, Cause I think having, ha- if there's, there's pluses, there's pluses to having um, both ends, people in, on both ends of that spectrum. Um, but I think seeing, so there's also value in um, people who are more quiet or more reserved um, or withholding, seeing other people being willing to say it for them, um, you know, give a different approach, provide a different approach to somebody to get them to better understand, um, see something a different way, see it from their perspective that they're not willing to do individually. Um, goes far, not even on the necessarily just in the, I guess, allyship aspect or um, kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing where not only does it make the person who speaks up stronger in their resolve, but the person who benefits from the person saying um, kind of what's on their mind, it gives them a little confidence boost as well, where it's like, okay, well, maybe that's not how, how I would have said it, but I could say it that way, you know, coming up with ways that they'll feel com- more comfortable in the future so that when they're faced with being a part of a united front, they don't kind of shrink into the bed. You know, years ago, uh, I was told by a few elders that I should choose and I don't choose. You're either going to walk the red road or you're going to be black. And I said, I'm not choosing. I am who I am. Take it or leave it. But you do have people within tribal communities. They say you either going to be native or you're not going to be native. There's no blending or whatever. So you have that going on. But I personally, I don't choose. I am who I am. I am what I am. Take it or leave it. Okay, y'all, we're going to stop right there because that is the best freaking segue. <laughs> the best segue. We have got our stop conversation. <laughs> we do for next week, y'all, because that is not only an issue in the indigenous community, it's an indigenous in the African-American community too, about yep. making people choose. Yep. You know what I mean? And about how we we will accept white ancestry before we will indigenous ancestry. And so- Yes, Lord. No, I'm kidding. And so we are going to stop here, ladies and gents. Um, I want to say, first of all, to my indigenous peoples who was here on the platform, please forgive me because when we started, because you know, the uh, look, the early debacle, <laughs> um, when we came on, I forgot to, um, I forgot to do the, the, um, the land acknowledgement regarding whose land we were on. Hmm. And you know about us being, you know, on indigenous land, Piscataway, and and then um, from talking with Sandra, I know it goes a little bit further than that now. And so I want to make sure that you know we do recognize that we are on indigenous land, um, and that next week, please do not let me forget <laughs> uh, that because that's the first thing that should have been done, you know, before this even got started was land acknowledgement, you know, and whose land that we're on. Um, And I had thought, um, um, I think, I I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly. She's Piscataway and Markisha, Markisha. Um, And she wasn't able to be on here tonight. Um, But um, I, if, I don't know what I'm trying to say. The whole point is is that I know I would have remembered if she had come on. (laughs) And, um, but with that being said, we're going to go ahead and we are going to um, say goodbye and thank you all for spending this time. Thank you for the debacle that it began with and you actually coming back and talking because <laughs> y'all know us, man. Usually when we jump ship, y'all know we leave the club or we leave a house party. It's a wrap. 
<laughs> We're not coming back. And so thank you guys. I really hope that you guys will come back next week. Um, if you can't, you know that you're always welcome. You ain't got to ask, just show up. If you know other people from our community that want to take um, part, take, you know, be involved in this conversation, please feel free to share. You ain't got to tell me. Um, they can just pop up. It's all good. And next week we'll be talking about the indigenous African dilemma. I don't know what the name's going to be, but right now it is the dilemma because we are having an issue with choosing and you're right. And it was, it's a, one of the main reasons why during the sixties movement between the black movement and the American Indian movement, why are both of our people separated? And, and I, and I, because of that main thing about having to make a choice. And so I think that is something good for us next week to really talk about. And then we all know that men will be on next week. So it should be very interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> to have the feminine and the masculine yeah, energy on together. Mm -hmm. And so you guys, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and say um, goodbye. Um, I'm always going to end with um, Kotia Anatan. I know I'm not saying that correctly, um, meaning in its correct um, accent, it is Twi, Tri, um, from the Akan people. It just means um, keep resisting oppression. And so I will always end on that. And if you guys ever want to end with an indigenous saying, please feel free because th this is our space now. Wanishi Kishelami, Wanishi Tawanama. And I pretty much said, thank you, creator. Thank you, family. Thank you, women of power. See y'all next week. <laughs> See y'all next week. Look, my only other language is Spanish and Arabic. I ain't got nothing else for you on that one. <laughs> that is okay. <laughs> it just means you're bilingual and that's an <laughs> ancestral inheritance there. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night, y'all. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. You know I can't leave until everybody else leaves. So everybody, please goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>